From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Peter Hanley at Western Maritime and Property. Oh, yeah, Mr. Hanley. I found this message to call you. You're still in town at the Beverly Hilton. Yes, that's right. I thought you'd be back in Hartford by now. When I can enjoy a spot like this on expense account? What? This California weather, the swimming pool here at the hotel. Uh, wait, no, 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 wait. You say on expense account? Why, sure. Dollar, you cleared up that matter for us. You proved conclusively that Randolph Merrill did not lose his yacht, that the explosion and the sinking were fake. That's right. And, and incidentally, as you anticipated, the yacht was found in a small Mexican seaport, all ready to be rebuilt and repainted to thoroughly disguise it. Good. Now, Mr. Hanley... Yeah, well, by the way, in spite of his earlier vindictiveness, Merrill has decided to plead guilty and throw himself on the mercy of the court. Has he signed a confession? Uh, well, no. Then I'll bet he changes his tune by the time he goes to trial. Oh? Sure, that's an old trick to slow things up, gain time. Are you having Mrs. Merrill held as an accessory? The Merrill has made and signed a statement completely clearing her, so to hold her now would only complicate matters. Hanley... Either you haven't yet read my expense account report, no, I or I forgot to, or I forgot to tell you what tipped me off that that bear was trying to pull something on us. Oh, what was it, Mister Dollar? Her jewels that you'd insured for a hundred thousand dollars. Oh no. Oh yes, Hanley. That jewelry Mrs. Merrill showed us was fake, oh, paste. Oh heavens! I, 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 Dollar. You, uh, you still think I ought to go back to Hartford? No, 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 no. Not until you found out where the real jewels are. Uh, can you come down to the office, Mr. Dollar, right away? Sure, if you like. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll drive out there to your hotel. Whatever you say. Yes, I'll, I'll drive out there. I'll, I'll be there right away. Scotch and soda be all right? Yeah, what? You uh, suddenly sound as though you could use a drink. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Western Maritime and Property Insurance Company, Los Angeles, California. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Wayward Diamonds matter. Expense account item one, two dollars and a quarter for drinks in my room at the Beverly Hilton. By the time room service had delivered them, collected the tip and left, Peter Hanley arrived. Yeah, come in. I make no bones about it, Mr. Dollar. I had completely forgotten about those jewels of Mrs. Merrill's. Yeah, well, I can't say that I blame you. We were so intent on exposing the so-called sinking of that yacht. Exactly. All right, all right. Relax. Here, come on now. Sit down and relax while we map out a plan of action. Thank you. After you hung up, I suddenly remembered that you had mentioned the fact that those jewels were fake to Mrs. Merrill herself. Yeah, that's right. All right, well, well, how did you know that they were fakes, Mr. Dollar? You remember when we sat in their living room out in Westwood while they gave us that cock and bull story about the yacht going down? Yes, yes, I remember. All right. She handed me the jewels to look at. I kind of absent-mindedly dragged one of the so-called diamonds across the glass top of the coffee table and realized it didn't scratch it. Oh. Nor did any of the others which proved they weren't diamonds at all, but some kind of imitations. Look, why why kid about it, Hanley? Up to that point, they'd had me believing their story about losing that yacht. You weren't alone, Dollar. You weren't alone. But now I suppose we'd better call in the police about that jewelry. Why the police? Well, to, to, to see if they can find the originals. Oh, now, look, look. The Merrills are a clever pair. They proved that when they almost got away with a $150,000 claim against you. For a boat that didn't sink after all. Very true, Dollar. Very true. So you can be pretty sure they didn't take the diamonds out of that jewelry and just hand them over to some fence around here. Yes, you're right. Later, I suppose, she figured to lose the fakes, have them stolen, and then claim the insurance. Yeah, probably. If we hadn't nabbed the old man for the yacht fraud. You say she hasn't been held? No. But I see now that we she should have been, in spite of her husband's statement that she was completely innocent of any complicity in the whole scheme. Yeah, yeah I think she should have. You know, it's going to take a lot of money to defend him. And with him in the clink, she's the logical one to raise it. With the diamonds. The real diamonds. Uh-huh, that's my guess. 
Very well, then. I'll go over to police headquarters right away, charge her with fraud. You know, because of the diamonds themselves, and see that she is held until she tells us where we can recover them. Hadn't you better get evidence of fraud first? Well, the mere fact that she substituted paste for the real diamonds in that jewelry dollar. Well, a lot of people do that. Never wear the real stuff in public unless they have a lot of guards around. Well, even no, so... No, no, Hanley. You've got to prove that she's actually got rid of the real ones. Or tries to. You see, I don't think she's had a chance to yet. Why not? No, no, listen. I'm running up a nice fat item for you on my expense account. What kind of an item? Well, so far it only amounts to $100 and $150. What for? Fee to a private detective agency. Somebody to tailor 24 hours a day. In the hope of finding out what she's doing with the genuine stones? More important, to find out how she'll try to dispose of them. But she may have done that some time ago. No, I doubt it. Why? It's only recently they've needed dough. Granted. They had two plans. The phony sinking of their yacht, and later, if that worked, a phony loss of their phony diamonds. But why later? Well, to run them both together would look suspicious. What's more, apparently saving the jewels made the yacht accident look legitimate. Yes, I suppose so. Sure. And remember this. She made a big thing of having saved her jewelry. When we still believed the wreck was legitimate. That's right. She made a big point of displaying those phonies to us because she wanted to be sure we'd not only see them, but believe they were the originals. That we'd be witness to the fact she still had them. Yes, I see. But she must recall that you finally recognized them as Pace. Yeah, but like you and I almost forgot about it simply because they had nothing directly to do with the matters at hand. Yeah, and she may think that we have forgotten. I mean, hmm? I doubt it. The point is, now she needs money. He saw to it that she stayed free to raise it. And the diamonds are probably her only way of getting it. Which is why I put a detective on her. Oh, excuse me. Johnny Dollar. Yeah? What? Well, how did... Yeah. Uh, well, look, I'll be right over. What is it, Dollar? Oh, that detective I was talking about has just lost his job. I don't understand. He just came to... Came too. Yeah, at the home of Mrs. Merrill. He, he's in her home? Yes, but she isn't. She's gone. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Although most men by nature don't feel in a combat mood much of the time, there are some who just can't get enough of a good fight, particularly if there's a good sound reason for it. In July 1900, when American fighting men were protecting the rights and liberty of their fellow countrymen during the Boxer Uprising, the battle was a furiously fought affair. Army Private Robert H. von Schlick, serving with Company C of the 9th United States Infantry Division, was in the thick of the fracas. Although he had been wounded previously while carrying a wounded comrade to a place of safety, he rejoined his command, which partly occupied an exposed position on a dike. Private von Schlick remained there after his company had been withdrawn and, in spite of the hail of bullets around him, single-handedly continued to fire into the enemy ranks. Oblivious to the fact that he was a conspicuous target, he refused to leave the fight until he was literally shot off his position by the enemy. Private Robert von Schlick earned the Medal of Honor for valiant devotion to duty and added heroic background to the code of conduct of American fighting men. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Wayward Diamonds Matter. <laughs> In separate cars, I still had my rental job. Pete Hanley, the insurance man, and I drove out to Westwood just beyond Beverly Hills. You're sure that detective was here at the Merrill home when he called you? Well, that's what he said. But if he was supposed to simply oh, tail... Come on, come on. Come on. Mr. Dollar? Yeah, that's right. And I take it you're Sam Bench... Holy smoke, what happened to you? Where's Mrs. Merrill? Well, like I told you on the phone, Mr. Dollar, she's gone. Any idea where? Oh, sir. Hey, you mind if I sit down? I, I don't feel so good. No, no, go ahead. Go on, sit down. All right, you all set? Yeah. Now, what happened? Well, I, I was walking up and down the street. Huh? You know, real casual, so as not to rouse no You've suspicion. You've been walking up and down in front of this house all morning? Well, yeah, 
Oh, morning. But like I say, real casual, so Where not... did you ever learn to be a detective? Some correspondence course? Oh, now, look, Dolly, you shouldn't talk like that. I resent it. Okay, all right. Go ahead and resent it. But prowling up and down in front of the house... Well, my brother runs a very good detective Your agency. brother? Yeah, and if he didn't think I was a good operator, okay, he wouldn't... Okay, all right. What happened? Well, <clears throat> I see her come out the back door. You know, Miss Merrill? Wow. And I see her go out and she opens up the garage. And where were you? Well, by good luck, I just happened to be in front of the driveway about then. So, real casual, I lean over and I start tying up my shoelace, yeah. you know, so she won't get suspicious of me, you see? Go on, go yeah. on. Well, when she gets in the car and she gives me a look, but that's all. So I figures me being so casual and all, she's not wise to what I'm doing around here, you know? Uh-huh, mm. I bet she wasn't. But that's where you're wrong, Dollar, because somehow she must have figured it out, even with me being so casual. All right, all right, what happened? Yeah. Well, Dollar, she comes bound out of that garage so fast, I didn't have hardly and time to maybe... And she casually ran you down. So I was casual about it. By the time I picked myself up and I find out I got any busted bones, she's down the street and around the corner. <sighs> what kind of a car was she driving? Uh, gee, no. What was the license number? I don't know. You don't know? Well, then how it happened so fast? Hey, look, whoever assigned you to this job ought I to have I told you, there. my brother. And don't you go say anything about my brother. How did you get into this house? Well, my order said if she made any move, I was to phone you. I figured the nearest phone was in here. How did you get in? Well, I looked around to see when the back windows was open. You have so any I... authority to enter this house? A warrant, maybe? No, but I have my orders to phone you just as soon as I could. And like I said, I figured the nearest phone... You want to see my orders? No, I don't. Well, look, see here? Now, you here. look. You can take those back to your office and shove them in your darling brother's face. Oh, and now you, you say things against just my brother. don't forget Shouldn't to tell him you're fired. Oh, now look, Dollar. Anybody can make one little mistake. You what? asked me, you made them all. Now, go on. Get out of that chair and get out of here. Oh, now, listen. Oh, and I uh, suppose that car that's parked right across the street, I suppose that's yours. Oh, sure. Oh, no. <laughs> so as if she made a move, I could follow without wasting no time. Real <laughs> casual, huh? Sure. So she wouldn't know you were following her. Well, of course. All right, go on. Get out. Oh. Now, look, you wasn't really serious about, about you being you fired. About... You bet I was. And you can tell your brother he and his agency are... Oh, go on. I'll, I'll settle with him later. Look, I, I'm not used to being treated like this. And when I tell my brother... Oh, brother. Well, Hanny, it looks like I called in the wrong detective agency. I'm sorry. I'm afraid so. And I suppose you and I have no more right to be in this house than that idiot had. So perhaps we'd better leave. Yeah, sure. But not until you get on the phone and call the Department of Motor Vehicles. Oh? Find out from them the year, make, and model of Mrs. Nancy Merrill's car. Oh, better still, I can, I can call my office. Your office? Well, yes, we issued the insurance on that car. Oh, good. Meantime, rather than just sit here and twiddle my thumbs, I'm going to have a look around. Uh, but, Dollar, if our simply being here is illegal... Uh... Will you stop worrying about it and get on that phone? In the bedroom, I found the jewel box, all right, but no sign of the jewels. However, in a desk, I did find a receipt. A receipted bill for some work done by a jeweler in Westwood Village. The amount of the bill? Yeah. It was more than enough to cover the substituting phonies for the diamonds in that jewelry. So when Hanley got the description of Nancy Merrill's car, I sent him over to West L.A. Police Headquarters to have my pals over there put out an APB on it. Then I hopped into my own car and headed for the jewelry store in Westwood. And you know something? If I'd had any idea of what was waiting for me there, believe me, I'd never have gone alone. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars. And behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Kentucky's state flag is dark blue with the seal of the Commonwealth encircled by a wreath of goldenrod, the state flower. Within the seal, two friends embrace. Their right hands clasp their left resting on each other's shoulder, their feet on the verge of a precipice, which illustrates the motto beneath them. United we stand, divided we fall. Kentucky's state flag, the flag of the 15th state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 26, 1918. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Wayward Diamonds Matter. Howard's Hillcrest Jewelry is a small but very exclusive shop on Weyburn Avenue in the Westwood Village section of Los Angeles. There, with the help of a receipt I'd found in Nancy Merrill's desk, I hoped to get on the track of the missing diamonds. I entered the snooty little shop and asked for the owner. 
I'm sorry, my good man, but Mr. Hard Howard is engaged with one of our important clients. Well, I'm here on rather important business. Well, if you care to leave your name and he wishes to see you, perhaps we shall call you. Ah, oh, Mrs. Smythe, Ken hey, look, Worthy. Buster. How delightful to see I you said... again. And did little hmm. Chi like the jewel collar we selected for him? Chi Such a lovely yeah. puppy. You know, he's the favorite of all my doggy friends. Just as you're my favorite. Maybe I'd better look for this Howard myself. <laughs> Mrs. Smythe, Kenworthy, you have no idea how it brightens the day to have you drop in. Oops, now, wrong department. what can I show you today? Some little trinkets for your pussy cat rats. We have some perfectly privacy things and real emeralds. No, no. But you huh? must please. Oh, Nancy, Nancy, my dear. Yes, Howard. My pet, when I removed the genuine diamonds from your various pieces and replaced them with paste... It was with the distinct understanding... I know, dear, I know. But now I have to have the real stones put back. Why? As I understood, it was in order to have the fake gems stolen so that you could collect on the insurance. Oh, of course it was, of course. Not so loud, Nancy, please. Howard, our plan to claim that the yacht exploded failed. Randolph is in jail. He didn't involve you in that, I must say, rather foolish plot. Oh, no, but I have to go through the motions of getting him legal help. Excellent, my dear. I hope they keep him in jail. Howard. Randolph has stood in the way of our romance too long, my pet. Now, Howard, please, listen. Because of the yacht, they sent an insurance investigator out here. Investigator? Yes, a Mr. Johnny Dollar. Dollar? Good heavens. You know him? I know about him. I don't like this. And he found that these jewels I have now are paste. Now, you've got to put the original stones back so that when he sees them again, he'll think he was mistaken. Impossible. I've already disposed of them through various connections. Why did you show him those fakes? Well, I, I thought... I thought... You thought wrong, you stupid wench. Oh, how... Don't you see? You may have opened the door to investigation of some of the other favors I've been doing you and other customers to beat your insurance companies. Oh, but I didn't think... Oh, of course you didn't. But if Dollar ever connects me with those imitations... Oh, dear. Oh, I know. And if they ever find out that the loss you faked here in the store that you collected so much on... Nancy, if they ever discover that that was faked, I'll go up for life, thanks to you. Oh, no. I could kill you for being such a fool. Oh, but, darling, I didn't know. I didn't realize... You don't know anything. Howard, please. Oh, shut up. Shut up and let me think. Well, if there's anything, anything I can do... I said shut up! Howard... Will you be quiet? I've got to think this thing out. I knew from the beginning that that stupid trick with the yacht wouldn't work out. I told you so. But it fooled the police and the Coast Guard. How were we to know the insurance company would send that Johnny Dollar out here? Will you stop talking about him? We've got to figure our way out of this mess. Now, who else besides Dollar knows about the phony jewels I made up for you? No one, Howard. Except my husband, of course. Are you sure? But how could they know? Well, what if your husband talks? Oh, he doesn't dare. Don't you see? He's the one who sent me here to get the stones back. So the dollar can't prove he saw the imitations. And I tell you, I can't get them back. They're probably scattered all over the country by now. But don't you see? Unless we can show them to him, the real ones, I mean, show them to this Johnny Dollar... No, no, then he... no, it's impossible. So, that means only one thing, Nancy. Replacing the fakes with some other genuine stones? No, no, that would take months. No, Nancy, it means that I have to get rid of this man, Dollar. <gasps> that gun! That's right. Uh -huh. You'd... you'd kill him? Yes, Nancy, I'll kill him if I can find him. I'll save you the trouble of looking for me, Howard. What? Dollar! And is that the gun you plan to kill me with? Yes, that's right. And I think I'd better kill you right now. Oh, Howard, darling, please. Oh, put that thing down, Howard. You're not going to shoot with customers out front. My private vault is just outside this back door of my office, Dollar, and it's open. In there, the sound of a shot won't be heard out front. No kidding. No kidding. All right, walk. Out that little door. Walk. Well, you don't really leave me much choice, do you? I'll open it carefully. No tricks. Tricks? With a gun on my back? All right, open the door. Go ahead. Oh, it seems stuck. Maybe you'd better open it. I said no tricks. You open it. Oh, Howard, you don't know what you're doing. You bet I do. Go ahead, Dollar. You may be sorry for this, you know. Will you quit stalling and open it? Whatever you say. Mr. Howard! Mr. Howard! Oh, no. What? Mr. Howard, there are some men here to see you. 
Fancy, go out there. Tell them I'm not to be disturbed. I'll see them in a few minutes. Oh, please, dear. Go ahead, go on. Mr. Howard, these men are from the police. The police? Well, bless Peter Hanley. Oh, no, you... <laughs> yes, I do. Dollar. Dollar, are you all right? Those shots are... Johnny. Hiya, Pete. Huh? Oh, oh, thank heavens. Thank heavens. Yeah. Looks like he's okay, Mr. Hanley. But, Dollar, what under the sun did you do to our friend Howard here? Well, we had a little argument, Sergeant. I'll tell you all about it, and then you can haul him off to the clink. Oh? Hey, listen, if you've got something on Howard Howard, you'll be our friend for life. Sergeant, I've got plenty. Good, because, brother, we've been trying to catch up with him for years. Oh, incidentally, have you got a cell for Mrs. Merrill, too? You bet we have. <laughs> Expense account item two, $50 in legal fees to make a deposition so I won't have to hang around for a trial or two or three. And I have a sneaking suspicion that Howard and Merrill and his wife are going to have a long, long time to think things over. Expense account total, including additional mileage on my rental car and the trip back to Hartford, $218 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. There are some men who, after being practically pushed into the service, find their element and commit heroic deeds. Frank Luke was that sort of young man. Soon after the United States entered World War I, Luke was taunted by his patriotic family into joining up. He was commissioned a second lieutenant after completing his flight training with the Signal Corps Air Service, that small beginning of today's mighty Air Force. Lieutenant Luke found it difficult to accept the discipline so necessary in the military. When he got to France and was assigned to the English Spads, his attitude worried his commanding officer. But Luke's performance in the air didn't. In less than two months in aerial combat, he accounted for seven enemy aircraft and earned himself the nickname of Balloon Buster for knocking down 11 or 12 of those menaces to the ground troops, the observation balloons. For his gallant action in the face of great danger and overwhelming odds, he was awarded two Distinguished Service Crosses and the Medal of Honor. Shortly before the end of the war, Lieutenant Frank Luke made his last heroic combat flight. After having just returned from a sizzling air battle, he refueled his spad and took off on an extra duty mission. Pursued by eight enemy planes, he shot down three balloons. He was wounded, and his plane was so badly damaged in the action that he had to make a forced landing in a German cemetery. Perhaps the irony of it struck him at the time. When called upon to surrender, he preferred to open fire with his automatic and fight to the death, though he was only 21 years of age. Lieutenant Frank Luke may have had trouble adjusting to the military life, but when he did, he was a gallant fighter and a credit to his country. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a quiet little fishing pier on the coast of California. Only they call it the Pier of Death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Paula Winslow, Ben Wright, Jack Crucian, Jack Edwards, Marvin Miller, and Joseph Kearns. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.